and let's pray. Lord, as we come to this time of communion, time to celebrate Jesus' death, to remember and to proclaim that which happened at the cross, where the wrath that was due us was placed on him. He was the substitute for all those that trust and believe in you. I pray you would bless this time. I pray that it would be fruitful. Jesus, that you would be glorified. And it's always in your great name we pray. Amen. As we spend time in God's word celebrating communion, we want to make sure that everyone has a copy of God's word in their hands. So some men are going to hand out Bibles. Go ahead and raise your hand if you don't have one. And if you don't own one, that is also a gift that you get to keep. For those that do have Bibles, when you get your Bible, please open your Bibles to 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 3. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 3. In this letter, the Apostle Peter is writing to Christians that are suffering. They're undergoing persecution and hostility, rejection, animosity, and hatred. And Peter is ex encouraging and exhorting these believers to stand firm in the grace of God. Our verse, verse 3, is found at the beginning of one long sentence in the Greek. Verses 3 through 9 are all one long sentence. And this long sentence, in this long sentence, Peter extols and praises God to, to lift these precious believers' eyes off of their difficult circumstances, to be reminded of the imperishable truths that are secured by the promises and the power of God. Please follow along as I read 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 3. Blessed, or praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who, according to his great mercy, has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. The main idea here is that God the Father has caused us, believers, to be born again. He has given us new birth. He has regenerated us. Every single person here has experienced physical birth. And being born was something that happened to you. When we were born into this world, we were not morally neutral. We entered this world depraved, ungodly sinners. Scripture tells us that we were all slaves to sin. All of our desires and affections were corrupted by sin. And left to ourselves, we had no hope. There was nothing that we could do to please God and to have a right standing before him. We needed God to act on our behalf. And verse 3 reminds us that that is exactly what God did. He is the one that acted. He is the one that caused. He is the one that gave new life. Believers are simply passive recipients of God's miraculous regenerative act. And we certainly don't deserve any of this. We don't deserve his mercy. Smed has spent the last two Sundays preaching about what we actually do deserve. We deserve judgment and eternal punishment in hell. But verse 3 tells us that it was according to his great mercy that he caused us to be born again. God the Father had great mercy on us. By removing the penalty for our sin, he did not simply make it go away, but in keeping with his perfect justice, he provided a substitute to bear the penalty that we all rightly deserved. He placed his wrath upon Jesus at the cross. The perfect lamb suffered and died 
to satisfy the wrath of God on your behalf, Christian. I want you to notice in the first part of verse 3, a little word that Peter uses to describe the relationship that a believer has to Jesus. He uses the possessive pronoun, our. Peter, speaking to believers, says that Jesus is our Lord. The one that has experienced the reality of being born again has responded to and recognizes Jesus as their Lord. That word for Lord is the same one that describes the master-slave relationship. This word for Lord describes one that has complete authority over all aspects of life towards the one under their authority. A believer is completely and totally subject to the Lord Jesus Christ. And if you're here today and you don't recognize and don't subject yourself to Jesus as the Lord of your life, then when the bread and the juice come, we simply ask that you would pass those by. This is a time for believers, the ones that have subjected themselves to the Lord Jesus Christ, to celebrate and to remember his death on the cross. However, I want you to consider that God's great mercy does not apply to you. He will, in fact, show you no mercy. You will experience God's judgment and his punishment. But it doesn't have to be that way. Talk to the one that brought you. Talk to me. Talk to any one of the other pastors. We would love to talk to you about God's great mercy that is available to all those that repent and believe in Jesus Christ. Believer, before you were born again, where did your hope lie? Whatever it was, it was ultimately a dead or dying hope. It was placing your hope in the things of this world or in the things built on the strength of the people of this world. But verse 3 tells us that we've been born again to a living hope. A hope that is built on the promises and the power of God. A living hope that will come to a complete and total, glorious, eternal fulfillment. That living hope is built on the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Because Christ died for your sins and was raised from the dead, because of the power and the promises of God in Christ, we have a living hope. We have an eternal hope. Please consider and contemplate this living hope that we have in Christ. And when your hearts are prepared, go ahead and take communion on your own, and I will come back and close our time in prayer.